All right, as we talk about God's Word today, we're going to talk about, and listen, I know a lot of people have been through divorce. I understand that myself. So I understand that a lot of people have been through divorce. Let me tell you, I don't believe it's the unpardonable sin because God didn't say divorce is the unpardonable sin. All right, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin. Although it has many effects on our lives. But I do believe if we are centered in the will of God and our marriages are centered in the will of God, we will make it through life together because God is the influence in our marriages and not man. All right? So now that's what God's Word really tells us and shares with us as we look at it today. So as we are going to look at scriptures today, I want to thank all of you and you that are dating and looking to get married. The thing that I tell people that are dating, they always want to say, well, I want to make sure we're not unevenly yoked. And they believe, well, if you're both Christians, you'll be all right. Let me tell you something. I believe that, yes, you both should be Christians when you get married, but I also believe you ought to have the same type of faith in God. In other words, you need to check each other out. Because if not, most of your arguments are going to be about church and God's Word than anything else. Now, that doesn't mean you can't work through it, but somebody's got to give. If you're a Baptist or a Methodist and, and you marry a strong, strong Pentecostal person, you're going to have some real issues in life. I'm just going to tell you, they're both saved, both going to heaven. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying, I'm just saying... You need to make sure that you can come together. And how do you do that? I believe when you're looking for somebody that you're going to try to spend the rest of your life with, what you need to do is you need to run to God as fast as you can. And as you're running to God as fast as you can, and you look over, you see the opposite sex running to God as fast as you are, you start asking God if that's the one. Because if you're running for God for everything you have and somebody else is running to God with everything they are, I want to tell you, if you two come together, God can bless that union and you two can be able to grow in him and not have the problems a lot of other people have. You're still going to have problems. Men are stubborn. I will give you that. Some of you women are too. You know, uh, there, there's... Uh, Sometimes some people are the ones that are a little overbearing in a relationship. Others are the quiet type. And then you get both of those type that they just kind of always are hitting heads because that's who they are. But if God's in the center of it, we'll all get through it. So today as we're going to be talking about in Mark 10, starting with verse 1. It said, then Jesus left Capernaum and went down to the region of Judea and into the area east of the Jordan River. And once again, crowds gathered around him, and as usual, he was teaching them. I think that's cool because every time a crowd came, Jesus took the opportunity to spread the gospel. I would say Jesus is our example, and we ought to be, take the opportunity to spread the gospel any time that people are gathered around us. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Pharisees were always coming. See, that was the religious people. They knew everything about the Bible up to that time, and they were always trying to trap Jesus because they wanted to, of course, do away with Christ. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. And so now they ask this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Now, why would they ask that? Well, because it was a problem then, too. And what was the problem then? Well, we're going to find that out in just a second, and we'll talk about it in a moment. And Jesus answered them with a question. I always love this, too. Jesus usually would ask them a question, so they had to think, and usually they couldn't come up with the right answer because of the question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, he permitted it, they replied. He said, a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. So, from what I read in history and the history of the church, even there was back then what they did was a lot of times, they didn't have to have a good reason. If a woman wasn't doing what she was supposed to do that they thought as a wife, they could just say, 
I'm going to give you this, and now I don't have anything to do with you anymore. That's kind of simplifying it all way too much. But they were able to do that. And we're going to find out why they were in just a second. It can go a whole lot farther. And believe me, I know that we could spend two weeks on this one passage right here and not probably cover it all thorough enough. So what I would do is challenge you to go in God's Word and read everything about marriage and divorce. Okay, and Matthew would be a good place to start. So, but Jesus responded, he wrote this commandment as a concession to their hard hearts. They weren't right with God. They were all griping, complaining about everything. He wrote this commandment as a concession to their hard hearts because they weren't getting right with God. But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. Folks, I want to tell you something. God has never made anybody anything other than male and female since the beginning of creation. I know the world wants to say that's not so. I know that people want to say, well, I can change my gender. I want to tell you, you can't change nothing. What you were born with is what you are, all right? And so, as we say that today, that's biblical. God made them male and female. I want to thank God for people that feel the urges to go the other way, but say, no, I know God is Lord and Savior. I will not do that because I'm a child of God. So, as we go on, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. One of the problems we have today is that some people don't really leave their father and mother and are joined to their wife. You know, some of you know right now, you know those mommy's boys? <laughs> that will listen to mommy more than they listen or apply anything to you, with you in the Word of God. Now there's nothing, believe me, I was a mama's boy. I called my, my wife can tell you, I called my mom all the times. A lot of times it was to pick on her, but I called her all the time. And she, matter of fact, she didn't feel love if I didn't pick on her. A lot of people, we had somebody leave the church a few years ago because I talked about my mom and they knew my mom from when she was here. I said, I can't believe it. You said those things about your mom. Well, you never lived with my mom. You don't have a right to say anything. You know, I mean, now if somebody listened to that and sends that to them, I'm sure they'll be mad about something else right now. But anyway, the truth of the matter is it's about whenever you won't take hold of the family that you got and the wife you got and become who God wants you to be in Christ, to have that marriage that is loved by Christ, is nurtured by Christ, and we do everything we do looking at the Father for the answers. There's nothing wrong with mama's boys unless mama won't cut the apron string or the boy won't and they get out on their own and do their own thing. If that's the case, when your kids get married, just let them live with you the rest of their lives. Baloney, that's not going to happen at my house. Sorry, it's not meant to be. I know in the Old Testament they did that kind of stuff, built a room onto the house, everybody lived there. Thank the Lord we all have our own houses now. I know it's not preaching, I'm just talking about it, but, okay. Adjoined to the wife. The man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. See, when you and I come together as a couple, we become one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. In most marriage ceremonies, you'll hear this used in some version or another. Divorce was never supposed to happen. Marriage is supposed to be forever until God takes us out of this world or takes us home. That's the way God planned it. He ordained it. A lot of stuff happens. We can go back to Matthew and find out that, yes, for it says that you can divorce a woman if they're or, uh, having affairs and things like that. It doesn't say you have to, by the way. Because if you can work it out with them and with God, that doesn't mean you have to. I've heard people say, well, they had an affair. The Bible says divorce them. No, the Bible does not say that. It says you can, but 
but doesn't say you have to. So, I know that says if you're married to an unbeliever and they won't become a believer, that you can, can divorce them. All right? I don't believe anybody should be living in abuse. I've had people come to me with black eyes and said, my husband's abusing me. Folks, I want to tell you something. If that man is not willing to get right with God, I think that lady ought to get away from him. But I've never told somebody to get a divorce. I said, you pray to God and let him give you the freedom to do what God asks you to do. And then do what God says. I've only had a couple of them come to me and said, I believe I have to. God has to. I said, if God tells you, I can't tell you anything different. But I will support somebody that shouldn't be in an abusive relationship. We're not supposed to be able to put up with that kind of stuff. Because Jesus said, we are his bride. And we are to teach, treat our wives like he treated the church. Jesus never did anything to hurt the church, us. He did everything that we might become saved and grow in him. And we as husbands have to take, and wives too, responsibility to give everything over to God, that God, so God can bless our marriages. And I know he does. It says, Later, when he was alone with his disciples and in the house, they brought up the subject again. This was a pretty heavy subject even back then. It's a heavy subject this morning. It's the reason it gets so quiet when you talk about it because everybody's got different viewpoints and different opinions, and opinions aren't worth a whole lot, but everybody does. He told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. And so, I know this is a tough, tough, tough passage right here. And I believe Jesus is saying they want to put it toward the divorce, and he's saying when you get married, you got to stay married. I also know you can't stop somebody if they want to divorce you. And you do everything within your power. They can't. You can't stop them. So, I do believe that God can forgive of sin. And if we ask God to forgive our sins, he's faithful to just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think the point is, as much as anything else, that when we look for that person to marry, we want to marry the one that we will be with the rest of our lives. Some of us are messed up in that. Our fault or their fault or whatever, we messed up. But I do believe once we turn it all over to God that he can bless us. So we're going to go on now to the next one. And I know there's going to be a lot of things going on in your mind. A lot of things I know could cover this in a whole lot of different ways. Said, so one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. Here we go, the disciples now, because they thought they knew more, said, don't bring your kids in here. Don't bring your kids to Jesus. Don't bother him. He's busy. Look at all these people. I could just imagine it. And that's all I'm doing. I could just imagine it. Look at all these people that come around. He's trying to teach the word to them. You know, folks, I want to tell you, if we don't bring people to Jesus and children to Jesus, how will they ever be saved? If we don't, man, I've, I've pastored churches before that said, all those kids just make so much noise. All those kids just run around. All those kids, well, I never did that when I was a kid. No, you had a parent at home and usually two parents at home that taught you how to act and taught you how to sit in church and taught you everything else, and these kids don't have those, and therefore they do not know, and you're not willing to help them know that. You're only willing to say, oh, look at them. That's going to annoy them. Go sit by them for a while and help them understand the Word of God and how they should act in God's house, not scold them all the time because they don't have a clue what you're scolding them about. So they bring them to Jesus, and the disciples say, "Now, no, don't bring them there. And when Jesus saw what was happening, when he saw this, 
he was angry with his disciples. Man, it really aggravated him that they would keep those children to come unto him. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. What is he really talking about there? I believe it's just simply, you know how kids just trust older people until they've been taught not to? You know how a kid, matter of fact, I know as a dad, I used to like to put kids up on something and say, jump to me, and I'd catch them, and we thought that was a fun game. You know there's not one time I put my arms back and let them fall. Matter of fact, I would have hurt myself to make sure they didn't hurt themselves. I, I, and they trusted me. Yep. Now, I, our, our youngest, who is now 34, I guess, uh, and so... I have to admit, I didn't always do things that they loved so much because she was scared to death of movements of about any kind. And so I would, when she was real little, I'd grab her by her feet like this and I'd turn her upside down and I'd swing her around in circles. And she would scream and act like a cat trying to come up on my body. But it was so much fun for me and I know some people, oh, you should have never done that to your kid. You know, I never dropped her, never hit her against anything. She's got... I think all of her brains now today. <laughs> She's capable of doing things. But Jesus was saying, you got to have faith like a little child. You just got to be able to come to Jesus and say, I don't know what it is, but I want it. I, I don't know anything, but I need you, Lord. And Lord, I, I'm not worthy, but Lord, I want you. You know why revivals are starting right now? I read an article or two about Asbury, why is it happening at Asbury again? I would like to know because I think they just let God work and they, do, and they listen to him. And uh, it said they had a sermon on repentance of sin and confession. And people started confessing. Folks, I want to tell you, anyway, the only way any of us get right is finally having enough faith in God that he can take care of things in our life and confessing to him our sin and giving him our life completely. That's the only way we can get right. So I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. That means we have to get to that point when we believe God will do what he says he'll do and he'll forgive us of our sins, he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness and we'll be able to spend eternity with him in heaven. We got to have that childlike faith and trust in God. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. You know, we dedicate babies for that reason. I believe it's more like a baby dedication than anything else. It wasn't a baptism. He didn't baptize the child. Baptizing the kid doesn't do any good. It just gives them a partial bath. But I believe dedicating a child to the Lord is a serious thing. And we need to dedicate our children to the Lord. And then it's our responsibility to raise them up according to God's word. Amen. It's not just to go and dedicate them and say, oh, they're okay now. No, that doesn't mean they're okay now. That just means we've said we're going to raise them up and nurture them in the word of God. In verse 17, it says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now listen to what Jesus asked him right here. You got to realize this word good teacher was not a word that was used much. This was being good to the point that Christ was sinless, really. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. You see, Jesus is God, He is truly good. But He's saying, Why are you asking that? Because that was something that people didn't say very much. And so, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. And honor your father and mother. Now that's a pretty good mouthful right there. 
I saw a little video this last week about this. I'm thinking about showing it to the church sometime. Uh, I think Brother Wayne sent it to me. I enjoyed watching it. And so, it says, Teacher, the man replied, I observed all these commandments since I was young. He said, I've done all those. Basically, I'm already there. I've done all that. Now what? You see, he come, came to Jesus to try to figure out a way to make sure he could get to heaven, not to come to no one was the only way that he could get to heaven. You see, he probably had climbed the ladder of success and had done it very well. The problem is the ladder was leaned against the wrong building. And you and I many times climb the ladder of whatever it is in our life, and we do pretty good at it. But unless it's a ladder that's leading us to heaven and to the throne of God, it's the wrong ladder. You and I have to be willing to do and follow him in every way that we can. He said, I've been doing that since I was young. And the word says, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Felt love for him. It's kind of like, he knows to say the right things, and maybe he's tried, but he just really doesn't get it. And we meet people like that all the time. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Listen to this one. Most of us today would walk away from God if this was said to us, I believe. Go and sell all your possessions and give them and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. See, Christ knew that what was standing in his way was the stuff that he had. He had done so great in his life. Now, folks, believe me, I am not saying that anyone that is called by God got to sell everything they have. God has not told all of us to do that. I believe you've got to be willing to do that if God tells you to. And some of you might be saying, well, I'm not going to ask him because I don't want to know. You know, I mean, but the truth is you need to be asking God what he has for you in your life. I know in just following God, and I'm not bragging on it, but following God three different times, we sold everything we had and moved in less than 20 boxes over 4,000 miles. So, to follow God, what God had in our lives. I'm not bragging about that because that's nothing. I'll just tell you the truth. There's a lot of other ways I haven't followed God in my life that I should have been. So, as he tells this man this, look what's next. At this the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. I want to tell you, I don't care what you have. It's not going to get you to heaven. might give you a little easier life here on this earth. It might do things for you on this, in this life. But it will not, cannot get you to heaven. It's by the precious blood of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that will get you to heaven. Amen. Nothing else. You see, this poor man wasn't willing to give up that. Wasn't a bad man, was a good person. Probably didn't do all those things or not very much or when he did, he stopped, you know? I mean, I don't know what the story is. But as we go on in verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them, but Jesus said it again. Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And this eye of a needle is really believed to be in a mountain pass where you can go through like that. I think if you wanted to use a little needle, you could do that, but I'm pretty sure that that camel would not turn out all right if it could go through that eye. 
I don't know about you, I don't want to try that. So, but he said it's easier. Because why? Because as we gain possessions, we start relying on ourselves more than we rely on God. And we think we're the ones that did that. And we don't always give God the credit for what he's done in our lives. And you and I need to realize everything we have was because of a loving God. Everything we will ever have is because of him. It's not what I've done. It's what he has done. We go on and said, disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Who can be saved? If you've got to be willing to give up everything, who in the world can be saved? And Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. You see... It's not by your power and your might or my power and my might. It's by the mighty power of a loving God that sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. That because of that, when you and I ask forgiveness of our sins in our life and we mean it from the heart, Christ saves us. He redeems us. I want to tell you, we know that we can go with him into heaven because of not what we have done, but everything he has done for us because he is God. You can't do it yourself. Then Peter began to speak up. That's nothing unusual. Peter's always speaking up. That's just who Peter was. He's the one that you know. (laughs) I mean, he's the one in the meeting that you know is going to say something. And you sometimes wonder, what is it going to be now? He said, we're giving up everything to follow you, he said. Yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. And in, the, and in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. Amen. You know, you may not get rich here on this earth, but I do believe when we try to follow Christ with our lives, we are blessed by God. Folks, I want to tell you, I do not believe in prosperity preaching. I do not believe if I give everything I can to God that God's going to give me a whole bunch of money. Man, I want to tell you, if I believe that, I'd be playing a lottery because I believe God was going to let me win. And you, I hate to tell you this, your odds are mighty strong against you. Of course, we're Baptists. We don't play the lottery unless we're in somebody else's town. And so the truth of the matter is God is the one that's going to bless us But all of our blessings aren't going to come here. But I do believe we get blessed here on this earth. But I want to tell you, in eternity, we're going to be living with millions and millions and billions of other brothers and sisters in Christ and children. And before the throne of God, we're going to be able to live with him and have everything that we've even dreamed of. And you say, well, oh, man, you need, I'm going to get a new car. You don't need a car in heaven. You know, are you doing that? No, it's not about material things. It's about being in God's presence and what God does in our lives and being at the throne of God and singing how glorious is God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be greater then. If you think a lot of yourself, you might want to read this verse again. They were now on their way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe. Man, they were having a hard time 
processing some of this. And the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus one more, once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priest and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. I want to tell you something, folks. We all know what happened here because we have God's word to explain it to us. Jesus was telling his disciples, even after telling them all this stuff that they were having a lot of problems with and trying to think through, he was telling them, I'm going to have to die, and, I, and it's going to be a terrible death. But on the third day, I will rise again. And on that third day, it will conquer hell, death, and its dominion because he was God in the flesh and would die for our sins. Now, I want to tell you, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have not asked me to come in and forgive you of your sins, then you can't know what that's going to be like because you won't be able to be there. Because the only way into heaven is receiving Christ as Lord and Savior. But let me tell you, it's not about just a few words. It's about from the heart believing and then following him with our lives. You and I should be sold out. Every revival that's ever happened started with a bunch of prayer. Not only prayer, but confession of sin and that forgiveness of sin, calling out to God. And many times those were Christians that a new Christ, but they were trying to take the long ladder, so to speak. And what we need to do is make sure that every strung of that ladder is a step that God is leading us to do.